Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I want to start by sharing three quotes for your consideration this evening. The first one, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And the second one, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. And the last one, the crucified Christ is the only accurate picture of God the world has ever seen. We are face to face once more with the great events which are at the heart of our faith, a faith that is grounded in the cross. These are some very high, holy, disturbing, and decisive events in Jesus' story. And we who would commemorate these events must take a deep breath, summon courage, and learn again what it means to discover the wisdom of God, which the world counts as foolishness, the power of God, which the world counts as weakness. And in order to do that, we have to come back to the cross and the death of Jesus, our Lord. It's very easy on this evening to become preoccupied with feet, with service, with showing our personal humility. But when we do that, I believe we water down the message of the cross. And we begin to fall into the trap of the oversimplified stories about what is happening over these three days. You've heard those oversimplified stories, the ones that contrast an angry God with a loving Jesus. Or those stories that say that God demanded the blood of an innocent. The only problem is such stories, such oversimplifications, run smack up against what Scripture tells us over and over and over. John didn't write, for example, God was so angry with the world that he gave his only begotten son. John wrote... God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. As a footnote to this, N.T. Wright has written that, that wonderful piece of music, In Christ Alone, which we will be singing on Saturday night. There's a line in it that Keith Getty and Stuart Townend wrote, and on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Indeed, tomorrow night, Charles Wesley wrote, still the atoning blood is near that quenched the wrath of hostile heaven. Wright reminds us that it is more deeply true to sing that the love of God was satisfied. On the cross, we see reality the reality of what is foolish and weak and what is wisdom and power, all wrapped up in love. The hard, embracing love of God. On the cross, in that love, we also learn another truth that Paul tells us, that there is no condemnation for those of us who belong to Christ Jesus. In Romans, Paul said, 
God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body, like the bodies that we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. Out of his bottomless love, our God sent his son, not just to share the mess and muddle of earthly life, but to take upon himself the monumental task of being the place where God would pass the judicial sentence upon sin itself. Sin, that deadly power, that poisonous snake bite, which means death. On the cross, out of his love, God condemned sin in the flesh of Jesus Christ. Jesus took the curse laid down for us, and that is the personal expression of the ultimate divine love. This is why the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to we who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is why the crucified Christ is the only accurate picture of God the world has ever seen. And that is what we announce when we receive the body and blood of Jesus. Now don't get me wrong, we can't deny God's wrath because to do so is to deny his love. When God sees human beings enslaved, abused, bombed, preyed upon, if he doesn't hate it, he's not a loving God. You know, if God were to say, well, never mind, I'll love you anyway, he's really, really neither good nor loving. The Bible doesn't speak of a God of generalized benevolence. The Bible speaks of a God who makes the whole world and says it's good. The Bible speaks of a God who loves it so passionately that he really must and does hate everything that distorts and de defaces his creation. Think about the stories of the Bible. They tell us about a creator God creating in freedom, calling a people through whom he would indeed try to make the whole world right, living with that group of people in covenant, even when they, even when they went wrong, allowing them to become the place where the power of evil could do its worst and preparing them through it all for the moment when he would come and take upon himself in the person of his son the pain, the shame, the horror, and the darkness of human existence. That's love. And we've heard about this for years. The gospelers have told us the early the New Testament writers, the early church fathers, Luther, Calvin, Cranmer, indeed Wesley, Getty and Townend, they're all talking to us about the incredible love of God that we see in these three days. They remind us that he would take upon himself the condemnation which is ours because he loves us so much. And he must do that over the deadly sin that infects our lives. We're going to be singing this for the next three days. Later tonight, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take 
frail flesh and die. Never was love, dear king, never was grief like thine. Tomorrow night, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my king, should die for me? Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. I, behold, I heard my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that nailed him there. And even though we won't be singing it, George Herbert said it well, though my sins against me cried, thou didst clear me. And alone when they replied, thou didst hear me. That's love. That is love in the face of the depth and the weight of the sin of the world. Because that is a deeper, profounder love. The weight of that love is deeper and profounder than anything that sin can smash up against it. That's what we announce when we receive the body and blood of Jesus. And that's why the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to we who are being saved, it is the power of God. Several years ago, a writer for the London Times during Holy Week wrote that religion is all about moral values, making the world a better place, and gaining a proper sense of awe about the mysteries of life. And he went on to say, all the world's religions are fumbling towards the same truth. I don't know if you remember, but back when there were print editions of Newsweek and Time, every year at Holy Week, that was the cover story, or some version of that. It's basically nothing but 18th century deism, that belief in a distant God, and just a generalized religious awareness within the world. Such talk generally doesn't really delve into faith. But when it does, it sees faith as a thing. Such talk has nothing to do with the death and resurrection of Jesus, which is why there is a Holy Week. Faith is not a thing. Again, N.T. Wright described it as more like a window in a house, which is defined not by the type of glass, but in terms of what you can see through it. Christian faith sees two things. Number one, a God who loved the world so much that he sent his only son to die and rise. Redefining for all time what is true and what isn't, what is wise and what isn't, what is weak, what is powerful, what is deadly, what is salvific. And the second thing is that as we gaze today, tomorrow, and Saturday, through that window onto our God, we are given the strength to meet such skepticism, not by hiding in a corner, not by denouncing it as being unreasonable, but by seeing what reason really is in the light of that accurate picture of God which we see on the cross. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to we who are being saved, it is the power of God. That is what we announce when we receive the body and blood of Jesus. So we are here tonight, not about our feet, not about service, not about humility per se. 
We are here about the new creation which results from God's saving work in the service and humility of Jesus. We are here to die with Jesus and to rise with him. That our commemoration in the bread and the wine of God's love will flow out from this place into this world that is filled with sorrow and disease. That it will flow out as a sign that God is indeed God. That the forces of darkness and death were defeated on the cross. And that through the healing power of that cross and the power of Jesus' resurrection, God can and does do all kinds of things from the depth of his love. The cross of Jesus Christ. Gaze upon the accurate picture that it gives us. Find its power in the bread and the wine. Because the word of the cross is folly for those who are perishing. But to we who are being saved, it is the power of God. And that is what we announce week after week. Amen.